Good morning uh, and a very warm welcome to you all. This morning we have with us some officials from the Ministry of Health and Wellness, and we are going to be talking in a bit more detail about the Omicron variant and what is to be expected, not only on behalf of the members of the public, but, but of course, what is being done by those who are working behind the scenes and up front and center in the Ministry of Health and Wellness to make sure that we do the best that we can to fight off this particular surge that is anticipated based on, on the estimates which were recently shared coming out of the University of the West Indies. So who do we have with us this morning? We have Dr. Clyde Cave of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. We also have Dr. Adana Grandison, who is going to be talking with us about home isolation and quarantine. Mr. Ronald Chapman, who is responsible for the area of COVID monitoring. And Leslie Rollock, a doctor within the Ministry of Health, a senior uh, officer in the Ministry of Health, as well as Dr. Elizabeth Ferdinand, who will be talking with us about the vaccination program. We also have members of the media who will be invited to pose their questions. And those of you who are within the public who want to ask questions as well can do so by sending your messages to us here at WhatsApp number 2561023. Well, let's come first of all to Dr. Adana Grandison because home isolation has been identified as a major change uh, taking place uh, as it relates to how we are gonna to try to combat Omicron. So give us an overview of what exactly is planned in this regard, Dr. Grandison. Good morning and thank you, Mr. Ellis. Uh, yes, you are absolutely correct. With this Omicron variant, uh, the home isolation model is definitely going to change. And this is prefaced based upon the fact that Omicron is expected, although more contagious, has been shown in most cases to result in a milder course of infection. And as such, uh, this this new wave is going to be based predominantly upon the monitoring of patient symptoms. What we have seen in the inter international context, certainly, and we are starting to see here as well, is that persons who are vaccinated generally tend to have a milder course of infection, whereas persons who are unvaccinated generally have a, a milder overall, if you compare it to Delta or Alpha or any of the other variants previously, but they still do have that potential to become severely ill. And based upon this, uh, we will still have our red, yellow, and green light system. However, there are some changes in terms of how we handle those patients. So I'll let you know. Our red patients are still considered our severe patients. Those are our patients with shortness of breath, uh, lower oxygenation status, and uh, essentially any sort of organ failure or organ compromise. Those persons will be sent immediately to Harrison Point via ambulance for their assessment and continued management. Then we have the group of persons who are yellow. Predominantly, these are persons that may have uh, mild to moderate symptoms and they are further split into two categories, whether this patient is a vaccinated patient or this patient is an unvaccinated patient. Now, if the patient and as well as patients who have comorbidities. And we know those comorbidities that can increase the risk of developing severe disease. Again, hypertension, diabetes, kidney disease, obesity, um, or any sort of immunocompromised state. If any of these patients have comorbidities but do not have any symptoms at this point in time, these patients will be reviewed in a 24 to 48 hour period by the home isolation team. And then a clinical decision is made. Why that time period for reassessment? Because we know that persons with the Omicron variant generally tend to show any changes in their symptomatology quite early. And so if it is that there is any potential worsening that would occur, we expect that it would occur within the first three days or so of illness. 
And so we will review them at that point in time and make a clinical decision if that patient is going to be safe to continue to stay at home and now self-isolate, or if we are going to have to send them in for assessment at a facility. In the case of persons who are vaccinated with uh, just a comorbid status, but no symptoms, those are persons that will be monitored as well. So we will not be transporting at this point in time patients who are considered yellow. This is now a time for reassessment of those patients, monitoring them a little closer, and then making a clinical decision if it is that we would need to send them into facility. And then certainly we have our biggest group, green. Those are the patients who are safe to stay at home. They don't have any symptoms or they have very mild symptoms, just a little sniffle, a little sore throat. And those persons are free to stay at home and self-isolate. What we're asking for the public, however, to do during this time is should you at any point in time develop any symptoms that cause you any worry, any worsening of symptoms, any worsening of that cough, any difficulty breathing, to go ahead and contact our call center or any of the hotlines. But we generally recommend that you go through our call center, which is 536-1800, which again, 536-1800. And then certainly for our patients who have come to the very end of this uh, isolation period, we're asking that you send an email to hidischarges at health.gov.bb. So that's h-i-d-i-s-c-h-a-g-e-s at health.gov.bb. And I, we want you to include the following, your name, your home address, your email address, your telephone number, where we can reach you. So please don't provide a, a house number where when we call, we cannot reach you if we need to. Certainly we want to know that date of the PCR test that you got, not a rapid test. So the PCR test date, we want to also know the first date that you had any symptoms. And for those persons who will need to be traveling shortly thereafter their discharge, if they will require a fit for travel certificate. Those are the actual bits of information that we would require for you to provide for us by email. For those of you who can't use email or don't have access to email, then we're going to ask you to, again, call 536-1800. So a, a major switch, uh, Mr. Ellis, from the home isolation previous model to now the home isolation new model, which also includes self-monitoring and self-isolation. I think you should also address the question of transportation for people who may be ill. How is that being addressed this time around? Certainly. So for those persons who will need to emergently seek help at Harrison Point, we will continue our ambulance provision services or by our red bus. But for those persons who we think will need that assessment that are considered yellow, we've reviewed them and we think, OK, we still need to see them in person those persons will be allowed to be transported in an orderly fashion using once they have their own transportation in an orderly fashion to the actual assessment center. So lots of changes that are being noted. Certainly you cannot present to an assessment center uh, without first of all, getting that initial telemed assessment to ensure that we are routing you to the correct location. We certainly don't want you turning up there and having to wait for long durations of time. So it's really an opportunity to try to streamline the program to ensure that everyone is seen in a very timely fashion. And for those persons who don't need to stay at a facility to get assessed and to get back home. Let's cross over now to Mr. Ronald Chapman from the COVID monitoring unit. And based upon what we saw previously, what are some of the guidelines that you consider to be important for people who will be in self-isolation? Well, as you know, isolation, the whole purpose of isolation is to avoid the infection of others. So what, what we are saying here is once you are, you are in isolation or you are in quarantine, you're waiting for your results um, to stay, 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 at home as, stay at home as much as possible. The only time you should be leaving home is if you need to go and seek medical care. Um, don't go to work, don't go to school, don't go into any other public areas. Um, and try to reduce the amount of non-essential visitors coming over to the home. 
So obviously you may need to get something from the supermarket which a family member or friend may be able to bring for you. They can bring it over and leave it at the step. But we are asking persons to stay at home, don't head out uh, and to reduce, don't have the neighbors to come over or any other friends coming over. This is highly infectious. Try as much as possible to separate yourself from others in your home. For some homes, this is quite easy. For others, it is not as easy. The disease is, um, the Omicron variant is highly infectious. So we do expect a lot of persons to become ill. But if you are in a position where you can remove yourself from the others in the home, this is going to be extremely helpful in terms of reducing the spread within the home. What is critical, and maybe I should have started with this one, is the wearing of your mask and to wear it properly. <clears throat> now, we know that Omicron is spread through, um, through droplets. When you speak, when you talk, uh, when you sing, when you, 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 you um, sneeze, cough, and the mask is critical in terms of reducing the spread of um, these droplets around the home. So you want to be able to wear your mask if as much as possible, if you can get your uh, surgical mask or maybe KN95 mask, if you can use those, sure. If you, have not, if you only have your cloth mask, you can also use those. But what we would be asking you to do is that you can maybe double mask if possible but you want to separate yourself from others and everyone wear masks at all times. I know this is gonna be a tough one. It is not gonna be easy, but in those homes where, you, where separation is not that easy, the wearing of masks is gonna be a critical component in the reduction of, spread, um, um, reduction of spread. Now, ventilation is your friend. You wanna be able to keep the windows open as much as possible. That's not always possible, obviously, um, depending on where you live and your home situation and so on. But as much as possible, keep those windows open, keep those doors open, get the wind to blow through and so on. So that persons, in, <clears throat> so that we are able that the, any, any viral particles in droplets or any aerosolization can be, re, can be removed with the wind. Now, if you have separate bathrooms, then you assign one of those bathrooms to the person or persons who have COVID. If you do not, then you have to share a bathroom. When you flush the toilet, make sure you cover it. That's very important so as to stop any aerosolization of the liquid in the bathroom. So you wanna close that bathroom down. You wanna make sure that um, there's, it is disinfected regularly after the use of the person who, who is COVID positive or any other person that, for that matter. So you want to be able to, to um, ensure that you, you follow these, you, you keep your eye out for these sort of things. Now, in terms of cleaning and sanitizing, what do you want? You also want to ensure that you use your, your cleaning and sanitizing has to do with the areas that are what we call considered high touch. Now, I'm not, in, I'm not going to tell you you have to industrially clean your house every day, but what you want to be able to do is to clean those surfaces that are often touched, your tabletop surfaces, areas like the doorknobs, the toilet, the, the lever to flush the toilet, <clears throat> bedside tables, telephones, even the TV remote that everyone shares. So you want to be able to, to sanitize those regularly. Now, sanitization can be done with um, the same 70% alcohol that we use for sanitizing our hands. We can use chlorine bleach, and we would recommend that you use a quarter of a gallon of chlorine bleach, to, sorry, a quarter, a quarter cup of chlorine bleach to one gallon of water. So you mix that, you stir that in, and you can put your gloves on, and you can wipe down your areas with that. For those areas that are, that cannot, be, you, you can't use chlorine bleach, which might um, uh, bleach out or get damaged. You can use, uh, in some areas, soap and water. And you just use a little bit more elbow grease to, to, to into those areas. But your soap and water, your chlorine bleach, and the, the, the normal disinfectants that you can get from your, from your supermarket, please read them to ensure that they are they, 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 they definitely can do the job. Most of them can, and you can use those to wipe down and so on. So David, 
there are lots more things I would like to say, but I think these are some of the critical areas that we want persons to, to pay attention to, to make sure. And as I said, the things I just want to reiterate, wear your mask, space is your friend, ventilation is your friend, and sanitization is your friend. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chapman. As Director of Medical Services at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, I'd like to hear from you, um, Dr. Clyde Cave, on how the QEH is bracing itself for this ant anticipated surge in Omicron cases. Thank you and good morning. Um, ever since the Queen Elizabeth Hospital opened its doors some 60 odd years ago, we have never closed to accidents and emergencies in, in this country. And there's no intention of doing so now. Yes, we will have to respond differently depending on numbers and severity and integration with other parts of the COVID management system. But I think it's important for the Barbadian public to realize that our point of contact, the Accident and Emergency Department, is for accidents and emergencies. We do have a culture of if service is not easily accessible elsewhere, you turn up at a &E. This is going to be problematic when the numbers are large. As Mr. Chapman just said, crowds are not your friend and we don't want people who have a suspicion of something that is important to them, but may not really be so significant health-wise to be gathering in large groups clamoring for attention. So if you are a known positive patient, Dr. Grandison has outlined the procedures within the isolation center where they can help assess you, direct you to the appropriate facility. But of course, for real accidents and emergencies, the hospital stands ready. We just ask that if at all possible, before coming to the hospital, you call our help desk, which is available from seven in the morning to 11 at night. And the number there is 536-4800, 536-4800. The accident and emergency um, team can be alerted to your arrival. We also have the health desk staff by professionals who can give you advice as to whether or not the Queen Elizabeth Hospital is appropriate for you. Now for our other patients, both our inpatients and our outpatients who may not be infected with COVID, they too will be indirectly affected because as our staff become personally impacted and have to go into quarantine or maybe are ill themselves, our services will have to be redirected. And this is not always possible with a lot of, a lot of notice. But it is planned that our outpatient clinics continue. Um, we have been using a lot of telemedicine, telephone contacts. We intend to continue with that. And our inpatients, we still are trying as far as possible by testing um, and the appropriate admission criteria not to admit patients into the hospital who are COVID positive. Part of this system depends on the honesty of answering the questionnaire. So please be forthcoming with any contacts or potential contacts. And when it is time for the patient to return home, we ask that you work with us so that we can free up the beds within the hospital where there is always a, a greater need. So I think those are where we would like our public to focus on, using our accident and emergency for true accidents and emergencies, calling our help desk and cooperating with your healthcare providers in both the outpatient and inpatient settings. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cave. And from the Ministry of Health, Senior Medical Officer, Dr. Leslie Rollup is with us as well. Uh, what are your areas of concern and guidelines that you would want to share with the public at this time? Thank you, Mr. Ellis, and good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to follow on a bit from what Mr. Chapman was, was mentioning about persons that are positive in their households. Um, we recognize that both Delta 
And Omicron may be active at this time. These are very infectious um, strains of the virus. And this suggests that if one person in a crowded household is positive, that it is very likely that all the others in the household will become positive in a short space of time. But there are measures that can be taken to try to reduce the risk of others becoming positive, including, as Mr. Chapman said, um, wearing the affected person, the non-affected person, and all the others in the households, household wearing masks, trying to, if the person is being asked to stay in their room, if that is possible, um, using the same sort of mechanisms that we have invited um, persons who deliver groceries or persons who deliver um, fast food to the door of the room, as opposed to the person coming out and using and then going back in. Um, so it's trying to avoid contact as much as possible within that same affected household, especially to protect if there are more vulnerable persons in the household. We do recognize that by the time one person is identified, it may be that others have already been affected or infected, but still, I have been, um, I know of at least two households where um, one person was positive, remained positive, went through the process, and none of the others, based on testing, became affected. So if there is a vulnerable person, elderly or um, with chronic diseases, and we know that rates in Barbados are high, if there's a known positive person in the household, especially if that vulnerable and um, this being with chronic diseases or unvaccinated or both, you try to protect that person as much as possible by separating yourself, doing the sanitizing and um, all the other measures that have been that have been outlined. I think I'll stop here at this point. Thank you, Dr. Rollock. And to Dr. Elizabeth Ferdinand. Uh, give us an overview of what kind of movement we have been able to see in the vaccination program since uh, it was revealed that Omicron is present in Barbados and to what extent uh, vaccination is relevant to trying to combat this particular surge. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this program. Well, we have been saying that vaccination is important. It's been important from the beginning of the epidemic and is continuing to be important. And especially now that we have the Omicron and our, within us, within our country. We have at the present moment, our challenges with the vaccine program, as you all know, with the nurses strike but our staff that remain working have gone beyond the call of duty to make sure that we have sites open so that anyone who wants their vaccine can come up and get it. With this right here now, beginning of a wave, it started already with the 400s and 500s new cases every day. We have to be very careful. We know that vaccine does not completely stop you from getting infected. And we know that this particular variant is very, very infective. So we expect that more and more people will get it. And people who get it might not have as many overt symptoms as with the Delta. But the sheer amount of people who might get it will probably overwhelm our polyclinics, as well as the family practitioners, as well as the QEH, as much as we try. So we know that vaccines can help and can certainly help you from having to end up at doctor's care or hospital or even intensive care at Harrison College, Harrison Point, sorry. Um, so we are, encouraging again, everyone who is eligible to come and get vaccinated. 
We are particularly asking that those who have not had any vaccine at all, and you're over 12 years old, to come and get your first dose. You can even get a Johnson & Johnson, which will give you the coverage to be completely uh, covered with only one dose. We have four vaccines available and we will continue to have those four for a while. I'll remind you of those later on. But please, if you have not had one, come and get it. If you need your second dose, even though you might have gone beyond the period of time when they told you to come back to get your second dose, please come and get your second dose. And if you are at the moment, we're using six months, six months post your last dose, come up and get your boosters. All right, so I leave it at that for the moment. Let's welcome members of the press and open the panel to questions from you. Please identify yourselves as you pose your question, that is. Uh, good morning, everyone. Barry Allen here from the Nation newspaper. Uh, my question is for <clears throat> Dr. Grandison. Uh, Dr. Grandison, the chief medical officer a uh, few days ago would have informed us that the Ministry of Health and Wellness had handed back over uh, facilities to the Ministry of Education that they were no longer using. But the question is, should the numbers surge? Should, should the forecast uh, actually come to light? Um, are any of these facilities on standby or, or do you think they need to be on standby in case uh, that you can use them once more? Thanks for the question, Murray. I think that that is an act, not I think, it is an active discussion that we're having at this point in time. Um, and I am very much sure that the Ministry of Health, if we should get to that point where we do have a very significantly increased numbers, that uh, the Ministry of Health will definitely come back and make the public aware of this decision. Um, certainly, there are implications on both ends. Yes, we want to keep the country safe. We want to keep children safe, but we also have to weigh that very delicately. And I think that we would also have to take into consideration the various stakeholders um, because children also need to meet their developmental requirements and educational goals. So that is a discussion that's currently being held. Um, and it is something that they're very sensitive and aware about. And I'm sure that the Ministry of Health will come back um, and make a statement about that at a later date when it is necessary. Thank you. Is there a follow-up to that, uh, Barry? No, go ahead. Other guys can go ahead. Marlon Madden, Barbados Today. I, I wanted to find out um, in relation to the vaccination, can we say what data is there now to show the strength of the vaccine against you know, the various variants in terms of the boosters that are required? Are we looking to give second boosters or third boosters at this stage? Well, at this stage, we are only giving first boosters. And I'm hoping that, <laughs> I'm hoping that the pandemic will disappear or go gradually down where we won't have to go into a fourth booster. But we're not calling it third booster, we're calling it a booster. And we are doing a booster for those people who have had their second dose over six months ago, all right? Now, let me just revise things. When people are given a vaccine, in our case, in most of our cases with COVID, it is a two-dose regime that you can then be considered fully vaccinated. With the Johnson & Johnson, they're saying you only need one initially, okay? So basically, we're using, as a primary series, two doses. The first dose gives you the first introduction to the disease. The second dose gives you a second introduction with an increase in your immunity response. And hopefully we were thinking that that was enough. However, studies have, seen, have shown that the immunity and the immune response wanes, it waxes, it goes down after a period of time. They're saying around six months. And that is why a booster was introduced at six months. We are currently looking here in Barbados as to whether we should reduce that interval of time. But negotiations are going on 
one or two countries in the world have gone down like England to three months. But the whole idea of if you're going to introduce it and, and when and at what stage, you look to see what is happening within your country. Are cases going up? What kind of age groups? What kind of people are being affected? And then you decide, well, when are you going to bring in your boosters and what you're going to use, right? So right now, it's just one booster we're hoping and let us see what happens, okay? Any follow-up from you, Marlon? Yes, I have a follow-up. Uh, are we seeing any cases with people getting COVID more than once? Let's say two or three times. Well, I the wouldn't be able to say no. I wouldn't I mean, be able to say because I'm not um, I'm not at the at the clinical end, but maybe Dr. Granderson. I may be able to. Sorry. Yes, uh, no. Dr. Dr. Rollins. Yes. Uh, I may be able to answer. We've actually had a, a few persons that we recognize that they, they were diagnosed with COVID before, and we are seeing them now uh, a few months later uh, with uh, what looks like a new infection again. Um, but the, to say that we've gone through and we could give you a proportion or a percentage, no, but we, we are seeing that. And it is not unexpected based on the changes in the virus. And um, that is one of the reasons why, um, well, it is, the virus is changing. So effectively the, the body has to recognize it to be able to stop it before it does anything. But right now we recognize that it is, the, the virus manages to breach the initial defenses of the body. So the person gets infected but not so far as to make them severely ill. But that is, that is to be expected. But the extent in Barbados so far, we don't have the, we don't have the figures, but I have seen um, that we've had definite persons that appear to be reinfected so far. But if I could come in here though, and that is why we say, even though you have got the disease COVID, once you get better, with as soon as a month has passed, four weeks to a month, you should come and get vaccinated. Dr. Kim, uh, as a pediatrician, I'd like to hear your thoughts on Omicron and its impact on children and how, how we are bracing ourselves for that. Yes, Omicron has brought certain twists with it. It is good that it does not seem to cause as severe illness as some of the previous strains. Children have always been relatively um, less impacted um, than adults, and this thankfully remains true. However, because Omicron is so much more contagious, there are many more children getting um, infected, and even though it still remains a small proportion who will be sick, there will be instances of multisystem inflammatory disease in children and other complications, particularly if those children have something else in their health profile that will make them extremely vulnerable. There is also the direct effect of a COVID infection, but there is the indirect effect of the COVID epidemic on our children. And it's actually being shown now in recent papers that children born during this pandemic actually have some delay in their developmental milestones. And this is not because the mother or the child was infected. That's a separate variable. This is because part of a child's development depends on socialization, on looking at faces, learning to correlate expressions with emotions. And when a large number of the people that they see have half a face blanked out because of wearing a mask, this is already having an impact and will potentially have long-term consequences that we're not fully aware of. So getting back to school is an imperative, as is the physical health of the children. And that's the balance we have to make from time to time. Omicron, for all intents and purposes internationally, seems to be expected to be a shorter, but steeper and sharper um, effect on the community. 
So um, maybe unbalanced, school may not um, have to open as planned at the exact time because of the numbers of infections in the community. And not just because of the effect on children. We know that children bring home the infections to the elderly and more vulnerable. But it is not anticipated that as a long-term strategy, keeping children out of school is the best thing to do. So it's a delicate balance. I think we've all been aware over the last two years that the best laid plans are subject to change quite immediately. The wave we're riding now is going to be sharp and hopefully short, so that if we all work together and do the things that we know we should do, protecting ourselves with public health measures and immunological protection through vaccination, I think we can get back to having our children in school in the shortest possible time, which is our main objective. Thank you, Dr. Cave. And as we transition to another question from the media, let me remind members of the public that you can send us your questions as well via WhatsApp number 256-1023. Thank you. Members of the media? Hi. Hi. Start some app star from network. I just want to get clarification. I had to come up briefly, so I'm not sure what this was dealt with uh, when I wasn't listening. But obviously, with the Omicron threat and the expected surge you, you spoke of, can you speak to the protocols for election day, how the, this, they will need to be applied and how that situation will need to be managed? What well, exactly would be those protocols, especially in light of, of the Omicron spread? Any idea? I think that's a question for Mr. Chapman from the COVID Monitoring Unit. Mr. Chapman? Yes, please. Um, so the COVID-19 Monitoring Unit would have worked closely with the Electoral and Boundaries Commission to develop a series of protocols to allow for safe voting. Now, these, these protocols were based on WHO recommendation for, um, for conducting elections and so on. So the, what we are looking at here is having persons come into a polling station, um, casting their vote and leaving it as safe a manner as possible. I think, and also the persons who are at the polling station. So it is the usual physical distancing within the line. Once they get to the door, that those persons are temperature checked and the process starts from there. There's a, they, they are, there are protocols for the actual being in the voting booth, uh, how they, they, in terms of cleaning, in terms of use of pencils and so on, and in terms of exiting of the station. Uh, so there, there have been a number of protocols put in place for elections, for uh, nomination day, which has already gone and those, those uh, those nomination, that nomination day went off very well. Uh, we didn't have any issues with respect to nomination day. So they, they, those protocols are in place. Is there a follow up question? Stetson, is there a follow up question on this matter? Maybe muted. Sorry, I'm doing about 12 million things, David. So sorry, I'll, let, I'll just go on to the time being and I'll come back. Good morning, Sharika Griffith from CBC. Now, given concerns about how transmissible this variant is, um, are there any likely recommendations in terms of reducing the numbers on public transport? Um, what about events that are currently given the green light to go ahead? Are we likely to see any changes where these things are concerned? Who's thinking of that? All right, I'll take that one because it has to do with the, the section with events and so on. At present, um, there, there has not been any change. However, we are, we are reviewing the, 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 we are reviewing the whole um, process. Um, as with all things, what continues has to do with the, what is going on in country. And those parameters are looked at and, and decisions are made from that perspective. Here's a question uh, from a member of the public. And I think this is one that will have to be addressed by you, uh, Dr. Cave. The question is, so if a COVID positive person is having a heart attack or was, an, was in an accident, 
the QEH will not accept that patient? That's the question they pose. Please clarify what the position is for them. No, that is a complete misunderstanding. The Queen Elizabeth Hospital will always remain available for accidents and emergencies. Both of those situations are genuine accident and emergencies and will move to the head of any line that is waiting um, at the hospital. Our concerns are that there will be a lot of people who are seriously ill waiting and that's the challenge to us to produce the, um, the system that will allow us to attend to those. My comments were more to the people who are not having heart attacks or serious accidents. The ones who know they are positive and are worried because they have a bit of a fever and a headache. As we're saying in the context of Omicron, it is likely that that will not require a face-to-face -face doctor's visit or medical intervention. And we're discouraging those people from showing up at the hospital and indicating that they either call our help desk or use the other facilities in the polyclinic and the isolation. Um, but by no means will the hospital ever not accept accident and emergencies. This happens in other countries where there are alternative accident and emergency rooms where people can be um, redirected for faster service. There is only one major accident and emergency room in Barbados, that is at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. And as we have always done, we stand ready to assist in accidents and emergencies. We are hearing quite a lot uh, these days that uh, Omicron is mild. Uh, this person wants to know how dangerous is it compared to the regular flu? I suppose you can take that one, Dr. Rolla. Trying to unmute, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Um, the consensus is that generally what has been seen with Omicron is, is that it is milder than, generally speaking, than Delta, for example. Um, however, mild is, as, as you would say, um, Handsome is as handsome does. Mild depends on the person that it has infected. Uh, so while we can say in the aggregate, the course of illness on a whole bunch of people produces generally milder illness. Um, we can't say for an individual, um, unless we know that there's some definite protective factors in place or that there's the absence of other um, things that will make that person more likely to have severe illness, that this particular illness is going to be mild. Compared to the flu that comes, that changes and comes every year, um, based on the, the knowledge of, I guess, the number of persons that actually have flu, possibly you could say that seasonal flu um, on the population that it affects every year of persons who are eligible for the vaccine and, and don't take it and then get infected, that it probably has, um, the, the flu probably has accounted for more fatalities than the Omicron variant. But it's early days yet. It is according to the number of persons that will be affected and then um, the vulnerabilities of those affected persons. In certain countries, it's mostly young people, and they seemingly, most of them, have been getting over it, and a lot mm -hmm. of them have not been presenting for care. Um, but as I said, the, the important things to look at is, is the persons who will be getting it and the vulnerabilities of those persons. So if we bring that home, um, in, in Barbados, we are fearful or concerned, you put it that way, because of the background um, level of non-communicable diseases, we are aware probably of maybe a third or a half of the persons that actually are affected by NCDs because those are the ones that have been diagnosed. But they may be, as I said, um, 
maybe two or three times more that have not been diagnosed who are also vulnerable because of, of their disease. Um, so it's, we are trying to encourage persons to arm themselves as much as possible with protection via um, using the non-pharmacological intervention, just assume that everybody else you see might have something and work to suit and try to protect yourself internally uh, with vaccination. It may not be too late, even though we are, we are hoping that it will be sharp, but short, that the rise, even though it may be short, will be short. Um, I'm not sure, I'm hoping that my musings may answer the question of the, um, the person that has asked. No matter how mild the virus is, it can still account for fatalities in the appropriately vulnerable person. Even before Omicron, we used to have deaths from rhinovirus, which is the common cold associated with. So it is not only the virus, it's also the vulnerabilities of the person that is affected. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grandison. You want to add anything to that? I actually think Dr. Rollett summed it up quite nicely. Um, certainly, although this is milder, Omicron is milder in terms of what the pattern of illness that we are seeing um, in comparison to Delta, um, we should not uh, underestimate this virus because it still does have the potential, given the fact that it is um, increasingly contagious and infectious to a population. And especially given our high NCD burden here on the island, it is something that certainly can potentially cause problems. We, we have noticed internationally Omicron hospitalizations, Omicron related deaths. So in as much as we are stating that it has a milder course than Delta, um, I don't think that you can compare uh, Omicron necessarily with the flu because it is almost like comparing apples with oranges. And, and then certainly you have to take into consideration, as Dr. Rollett said, the underlying health state of the person, um, which to be quite honest here in Barbados, uh, especially over these past two years, um, has not been as optimal as, as we honestly need to have it in, in terms of our, our NCD burden here locally. And I think probably during this time with the increasing amount of stress, there have been some more persons who may have developed some of those NCDs that plagued us, um, put on a few more pounds, certainly developed hypertension and diabetes and may not even know their status. So I think it's something for us to, to keep in mind. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so go ahead. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to sorry. add to both um, interventions there in that we at this point don't know the effects of the long COVID in other words, whether this, whether long COVID will be more or less or the same after Omicron as, as with the other variants. So that's another factor that we have to take into consideration. And on that particular point, are we in a position to give any idea of approximately how many people in Barbados have come down with long COVID, as it has been called? Unfortunately, I, I can't answer that one. Dr. That's Rollins, the are you... I don't know. Sorry, not at this time. No. Not at this time. Um, that uh, I have a question, time. Mr. Ellis. Yes. Quickly yes. before we go. It's a question for, for Dr. Grandison. I'm not sure uh, if you will be able to answer it, but hopefully you can. A couple months ago, the Prime Minister would have said that based on the evidence that they have received, that Barbados' COVID-19 environment was one of mostly unvaccinated people. But in the last three months, we have seen a number of vaccinated people in Barbados uh, contracting the COVID-19 virus. Has our paradigm shifted? Um, in other words, has the evidence shown now that um, the amount of vaccinated people with COVID-19 are catching up to the amount of unvaccinated people with COVID-19. And the follow-up question would be one for Mr. Chapman to tell the country if the COVID monitoring unit is yet in receipt of any information coming out of the events that would have been held over the old year's night, New Year's Eve uh, time frame, um, because those events would have been what we call vaccinated events. Um, so ha have has the unit re received any information that quite a few people or a lot or even a little bit 
of people came down with the virus as though they were vaccinated from attending such events. Thanks. I'll take I'll take the first part. Thanks a lot, Barry, for the question. Um, I think something that we need to, to keep very, very clear in our minds. The vaccine is given not to prevent you from getting infected with SARS-CoV-2. The vaccine is given to prevent you from developing severe disease. This vaccine works by fortifying the immune response, providing antibodies that will protect the lungs, the lower respiratory tract, the primary target organ, which this virus will attempt to attack to cause mortality. This vaccine, the vaccines that are on the market, not just this vaccine, but the vaccines that are on the market are, are there to provide you with the greatest level of protection from a, a, the organ specific standpoint, the lungs. If we had to see this here, and I, I think last time that I did a presentation, I, I almost said that this here was the safe, the area that you need to protect, just like if you had your passport, your, your money, everything in the home. Um, certainly, so you will see persons from time to time that are vaccinated who will get infected. However, I can tell you this, based upon what we have seen in home isolation, the persons who are vaccinated by large, are certainly persons who remain asymptomatic for the entire course. They clear the virus at a faster rate and they generally tend not to have to go in to Harrison Point or any of the other facilities for medical intervention. They may have a social situation where we may have to, previously, especially with Delta, where we may have had to send them into a facility to protect the remainder of the family. But certainly the reason that they would have presented to that facility was not for medical intervention. And, and on contrast, we have had unvaccinated persons who have been in the program. Some of them may, got, may have gotten infected just like a vaccinated person. However, their course of their disease profile certainly has one been a bit more extended. So they take a little longer to clear that virus. And a lot more of them end up being up triage to a yellow or green, uh, yellow or red in the old system to be transported and need to seek medical intervention. So they need that care. They need the oxygen support. Um, they need medical intervention. So I can tell you after having looked at the data and all of the persons who are coming in and out of the home isolation program, the vaccine works. The vaccine definitely works. And certainly if you then take the vaccine and you couple that with the non-pharmacologic interventions within the home, you see even a greater protective effort that this here is providing. Thank you, Dr. Granderson. But the, the one thing you, I don't think you did answer, though, is if you've actually seen a shift in the infection rates. Because the Prime Minister has said that, let's say, 80% of the people coming down with the virus were shown to be unva unvaccinated. Has that paradigm shifted? Are, is it like 60-40 now, 70-30? That, that was the real basis of the question. So I think probably Dr. Ferdinand would need to answer that question. But I think that that would hold that would bear, the question would bear probably a lot more weight if it was that the vaccine was preventing infection and the vaccine does not prevent one from getting infected. Um, the vaccine prevents severe disease and death. So I think that needs to be made very, very clear. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Ferdinand probably you want to jump in at this point in time. Okay, all I can say really is that Barbados itself, we need to do more studies on, on similar thing of what you're asking, Barry, right? And to tell the truth, <laughs> most of our clinicians and staff and, in, and investigators are so busy dealing with the epidemic is that, you know, we're not doing enough research. And that is my personal opinion. But I really do think we need to do more for ourselves, but it's the time and effort to do it. Um, we, we don't have the answers to what you're saying. We can guesstimate and suggest, but at the present moment, I certainly don't have it and neither does Dr. Grandison. And I'm not sure whether Harrison Point would have that. But remember, they would only be seeing the very serious ones. So one would have to take every case and look at them and say vaccinated versus vaccinated when they got the disease and versus when they didn't get the disease, what were the symptoms like? severity, classify them, 
it's a, a, a lot of work to be done, but it, and I'm not saying it can't be done, but I don't think we have the uh, resources at this present moment to do that. A I wanted to Chapman. jump Sorry. in a yes. minute. Yes, um, there were two. I, 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 I'm not sure if this is, is provoking this, this question, but there were a couple of dashboards um, that went out showing more vaccinated um, persons, a higher proportion of vaccinated persons that were in facility isolation. Um, and part of the reason for that was that there were a few um, visitors that were fully vaccinated, um, became ill, not that they were, they needed hospitalization, but they needed accommodation and they were accommodated um, in the facility isolation initially um, because the places where they were, where they were, would have been staying the hotels and so were not at that point recognized as um, places to isolate. So for a couple of dashboards, it may change as we go more fully into what we call self-isolation. The numbers of vaccinated who were identified as infected included uh, a fair number of, of visitors who we, who we were accommodating, um, but they were not um, ill, as, as we are saying. They, they, with the more infectious variants, especially the vaccine for pre prevention of severe illness and death. And that's what, that's what we are pushing it for in this country. There was a, a question which was posed to Mr. Chapman uh, by Barry mm -hmm. Yeah, so Barry, um, at this point, we haven't seen any evidence which would, um, which would suggest that any of the events would, would have been a source of, um, would be any, would have been a super spreader or anything of that sort. So um, we are still, we are still monitoring, but as yet we've seen nothing to suggest that the events have been an issue. Any other questions before we wrap up? I have a question for Dr. Cave. Earlier he mentioned something very interesting about children. Um, there some delay in the development of children. And I wanted to find out if we have any data to point to the any change in the birth rate over the last year, especially given it's a full year with COVID compared to prior years. I don't have that information for you as yet. Our annual review of that will be sometime in, in early February. Our birth rate has been falling um, successively over the last seven or eight years, and we have not really appreciated a reversal of this trend. So I would anticipate just anecdotally from the numbers that we have not really changed the number of births, but our annual perinatal data review, when we look in detail at um, the previous year, um, that will be forthcoming in February and we'll make sure you're invited. Thank you very much, Dr. Cave. Also, Dr. Leslie Rollock, Dr. Donna Grandison, Dr. Elizabeth Ferdinand, and Mr. Ronald Chapman. Thanks also to the members of the media who participated in today's uh, media conference. Uh, this is one in a series of this type of uh, session that will be taking place because, as you can well appreciate, the situation with Omicron in particular at the moment is quite fluid and it is absolutely necessary that we do as much as we can to keep you, the members of the public, abreast of the various developments that are taking place and the measures that are being put in place to protect us all. Thank you all very much. <laughs>